welcome once again to Now Out St. Louis. I'm your host, George Blaze. Uh, thank you for sticking with us and joining us. I know it's been a couple of weeks since we've had some new interviews, but I've been kind of out of town. People have been working on stuff. Everyone's making this transition uh, back into the studios and back into the office, and that means us as well. But uh, please bear with us, and we'll continue to bring you great content and great conversations from people in the St. Louis, greater St. Louis region uh, about things you should know about and things you should care about. Joining me today is a guest you've probably seen before if you've watched the program, Ajuma Muhammad. He's a licensed trauma specialist, a, uh, a motivational speaker, an author, and uh, just a community leader in all senses of the word. Ajuma, it's good to see you again. It's good to be seen again, and I'm honored to be here. And I pray to Almighty God that he will bless me to hopefully say something that will inspire and motivate and uh, even educate our community. So I'm honored to be here. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you. Um, well, you know, since the last time I talked to you, uh, for the most part, uh, a lot of our youth have made the transition back into the classroom. Um, for some, that's worked out fine. Um, for others, um, it's been such a long time and the teachers have been away from them face to face for so long, um, not to mention all the safety protocols that people have to consider. Um, there, there's, there is something traumatic about these shifts that we have to make and we all have to be patient um, with each other, whether we're administrators, educators, uh, or children, families, and parents, that um, these kind of major nationwide transitions are going to be difficult. They're going to be bumps. Um, what, what kind of words of advice or words of wisdom can you give um, to parents who are watching today who are having a hard time bringing the transition back into school, getting back to going to work at the office, th these kind of things? Well, I think uh, your summation was great uh, in terms of the way you just uh, described everything. You know, there's gonna be an adjustment on the part of the parents, on the part of school officials, on the part of students. Students have been pretty much out of school for almost a year. So, you know, this is a test of everybody's patience and endurance, and uh, it's gonna take the collective whole of all parties involved to really kind of move strategically, methodically, and very slowly and also to be very, very patient with one another because this is an adjustment. And so all of us previously, we had to make a paradigm shift in terms of operating in the virtual world. And now we're back for the most part in the physical world. So we've got to make another paradigm shift and readjust, recalibrate to this new reality that uh, we find ourselves in. So I think the best advice that I could give the community is to be very, very patient and also be very, very supportive in terms of this new transition, this new era that we're moving back into. And I hope and pray that the COVID uh, virus doesn't creep back in as we move closer into the winter months. So I hope it doesn't become problematic for all parties involved. Uh, some students, when they uh, were part of the virtual world, world, they seem to do okay. And then probably 50% or maybe 40% didn't necessarily uh, like it. And it was very difficult for them and they fell behind academically. So hopefully that doesn't uh, emerge once again. Uh, one of the aspects of particularly for working parents who have been uh, fortunate enough to be able to work from home during this time and now transitioning back into working in the office is that uh, m many have found different ways um, um, to, to organize their daily lives and many have found it actually more functional um, to be at home, particularly when we deal with issues of child care and just, you know, general housekeeping, this kind of thing, that it's actually uh, uh, people have created a new world for themselves and they're like, uh, maybe I just don't want to go back to an office. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's probably 50% of the people on both sides of the spectrum. One, uh, one group who probably look forward to getting back into the office because that's what they're accustomed to. Then there's another 50% that have found that, hey, I can still achieve the same objective and stay at home and also cut the cost of uh, child care or daycare. So uh, I think you'll find people on both sides of the spectrum. Um, from what I understand that uh, there is probably another segment of population who are not really wanting to go back into that office cubicle or back into that corporate uh, arena. And they're kind of comfortable where they are. So, you know, uh, I, I, as they say, to be continued, we'll see how this plays itself out. When we look at stuff going on, you know, nationwide, um, there are a couple of major, I, I guess you could call them uh, points of conflict between the corporations and their employees and staff, not the least of which I had to deal with this past weekend uh, with Southwest Airlines. 
Um, they were mandating vaccinations for their pilots and the pilots union says they didn't organize a, a sick out, but suddenly uh, over the weekend, everything at Southwest Airlines was in utter chaos. Um, and it all kind of goes back to the roots of people not being happy with being mandated uh, on the vaccinations. Uh, are we gonna see more of this kind of thing? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. As you previously stated, uh, Southwest, they canceled over a thousand flights over this past weekend. Uh, from what I understand, Southwest canceled over 300 flights yesterday. And uh, there is a corporate mandate that many corporations are starting to follow where they want to mandate that their employees get vaccinated. Anytime you mandate something, people tend to oppose that, resist that, and become adversarial towards that because they're being mandated to do it. So again, this is one of those chapters to be continued. We're going to see how this thing plays itself out. But, uh, you know, you have 50, 60 percent of people who are open to getting the vaccination. And there's another 30 percent, maybe 40 percent who who uh, are still um, who still have reservations about uh, taking it. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. I know that it's having a dire impact on the economy. So, again, that's another one of those chapters to be continued. Uh, there are a lot of people who are just refusing to go into work and don't want to go to work uh, because of these restrictions and just some other moving parts that are in place as well. So there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market. There's a lot of uncertainty in America. So to be continued. Uh, for sure. I mean, I think this is just the, the first of a couple of uh, battlegrounds we're going to see uh, in this transition period that we're in. Um, the 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 last the last Savior's Day speech that uh, that uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan gave, um, he didn't spend the, the usual like broad sweeping uh, type of speech. I know, you know, his, his health is, is not what it used to be, but he did speak uh, in depth uh, about what's going on with um, these vaccinations and the virus. Um, I was wondering if you could just shed some light on, on people, particularly when we're trying to understand and trust what's going on here, and yet we have a history of mistrust in the community that is well-founded as well, it's historical. Um, how, how do we counsel people into making the right decision for themselves and their families? You know, that's a very powerful question. It's a loaded question. I don't know if we can really counsel people one way or the other because there's so much information out there, number one. Number two, there's so much misinformation out there, number two. And there, number three, there's a lot of information that is convoluted and contradictory. So in terms of this vac uh, vaccination, it's really an in it comes down to an individual choice and an individual decision. I know people on one side of the coin who swear by the vaccination, that they feel really good that they got it. Uh, and then there's another 50% of the population or 50% of the people that I know who absolutely wholeheartedly reject the notion of taking this uh, vaccine. So again, I think, um, it, you know, any word that I could purport to the community would be, do your own individual research, make your own individual choice, if it works for you, I would say go for it. If it doesn't work for you, then just understand the risk associated with not taking the virus. You know, one, one, one of the things, George, that is really not talked about that I think should be talked about is the value of maintaining your health, optimal health. Now, we know that you can still get the virus even if you're in the best of health. However, you know, there's a lot of research that says that a strong immune system, that if you succumb to the virus, that it will enable you or help you to overcome the virus and it helps in the rehabilitative process or rejuvenation process of bringing your, your body back into its equilibrium state or a healthier state. Uh, but they don't talk about that much. And I think that's something that should be talked about is eating right, getting the proper rest, uh, getting your body in the best of health. So if you do get the virus, in fact, I had the virus and I was down probably for about eight or nine days, but I rebounded. I didn't have any side effects, any residual lingering effects. And, um, you know, I was okay. And I think that is because I'm, I'm a health fanatic. I'm uh, very, very serious about my health. I eat right, I exercise daily. And I think that helped in the, in the interim of helping me to kind of restore my health. Yeah, it, it really would have been very helpful over this period of time if we would have heard a, a lot more 
um, on that end. I know that, you know, the circles I run in, immediately people were sending me all kinds of stuff like, hey, George, I'm going to send you some sea moss. You'd make the sea moss gel. Make sure you take your vitamin D3 and all this stuff. And I was like, okay. Um, and, you know, I, I also caught it last November, last October sometime, and it was very mild. I, you know, I was down for maybe two or three days, and then that was it. Um, but I know other people who, who I'm acquainted with who were sick for, you know, really, really sick and in the hospital. Um, so it strikes everybody differently. But I, I have to say that, you know, the, the things I was told to do initially way early on, like in January, um, it helped. It had to help. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I would encourage people to continue to take those safeguarded steps. You know, uh, I talk to people all the time. I encourage them to keep uh, to continue to wear their masks. I encourage them to continue to practice social distancing. I encourage them to, to be very careful and considerate about their comings and their goings and to not go to sleep and not relax. You know, as we move closer to the winter season, uh, to the month of December and January, we know that um, you know, this is a very difficult time for a lot of people where they catch the cold and catch the flu. And so we don't want anyone to succumb to it. So again, I strongly encourage everyone uh, who is listening to my voice to practice safe protocols and not to get comfortable. Uh, we don't want to hear about anyone becoming victimized by this virus and, and uh, ultimately dying. I know too many people, personal friends and loved ones that have lost their life as a result of this virus. So the virus is definitely real, it's very serious. And it's not something that should be minimized. And, and, and you know, speaking um, from your experience as a, you know, licensed psychotherapist and trauma specialist, um, it, it, it there's something about the masks that I've noticed, you know, in just traveling around the country um, over the past year or six months or so that, you know, different areas have kind of different levels of, uh, of what they're doing with the mask mandates or no mask mandates in, in, in public spaces. And um, the places where, you know, they really are mask heavy, even outside and outdoors and things like that. There's something there's there's something psychological about not being able to see human expression. Um, and particularly when we're in an environment where people already have uh, ingrained fears of others and certain types of agoraphobia and, and, and that kind of thing. And now we're in a world where we can't even see anyone's expression. Um, this has to exacerbate a lot of the racial tensions we see, um, a lot of the um, you know gender and, and, and sexual orientation tension that we see out here. There has to be something to that. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, that's a very interesting phenomena, and I think you are absolutely spot on with everything that you're saying. You know, it's something about uh, human interaction. You know, if a person upsets you, you'll probably see a growl or a frown. Or if a person is happy or excited, you'll see laughter or you see a smile. And to not see those things because most of us, or the majority of us are wearing masks right now, it really kind of takes away from the human human dynamics and human exchange that people have uh, with one another. You know, we're vibrational people and we emit certain vibrational energies. And so when a person is uh, radiating a certain kind of energy and vibration, then you feed on that. Uh, the, the person opposite opposite of that will feed on that and they will tend to give it back. And with the mask mandate or many people wearing the mask, it really kind of takes away from that. So it makes us have to work a little bit harder. We have to be a lot more creative. And uh, it does take away, you know, it's one of those things you don't you don't realize how precious it is until it's gone. Uh, those little things, which are really, really big things, to be able to see a person smile, to be able to just see their facial expression and their vibrational energy. So hopefully at some point, you know, if we continue to uh, wear the mask, we can uh, begin to get a better handle on this virus and we can get back to that human exchange where, you know, we can see each other's face and appreciate each other's uh, personal energy. One of the other areas in which, um, you know, I've been getting a lot of feedback from people that I should talk about or I should ask about or that we should at least try and discuss openly is uh, in the criminal justice system, the impact that the, the coronavirus and this the um, this entire outbreak has had on um, what's going on in many of the correctional facilities across the country. I have uh, my, my people in New York telling me Rikers Island is basically if the inmates are running the place now because there just isn't staff there 
And without their cooperation, the whole thing would collapse. Um, the same thing is happening in different places all around the country. Um, this is a, a very tenuous situation, and uh, it, it doesn't bode well if we don't get this part of it uh, wrapped up and put together and take care of people. Um, even if they're locked up, they deserve uh, just basic human care. Absolutely. These are unprecedented times. There's so many different moving parts and so many different layers to this. I'm hoping that we will come out on a, um, on, on the positive side of things, ultimately. Uh, as you said, that uh, many of the inmates, uh, regardless of their offense, still deserve um, uh, the care that is afforded to them. And because there is a shortage, it, it has created more problems. And I'm sure the uh, situation uh, that many inmates find themselves in has become even more dangerous and deadly as a result of being short staffed and just the chaotic environment that uh, 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 that it takes to run a prison and to exist and to survive uh, in a prison or, or jail situation. So these are unprecedented waters, these are unprecedented times and uh, just very, very chaotic, which which raises the issue of stress and anxiety you know, as a mental health professional, and feel free to jump in at any time, but anytime I have the opportunity, I always want to just really, really talk about all health begins with mental health. All health begins with mental health. And in this chaotic time that we live, it is so important to take time to relax, time to meditate, time to draw, time to journal, time to partner with positive people who see the value in you, who can support you emotionally, socially, and psychologically. Everyone, every one of us need to kind of find what I call that sweet spot or that sweet space where if it's yoga, if it's swimming, if it's exercise, if it's meditation, if it's doing crossword puzzles, whatever your happy medium is, it's important that you do that and you do it consistently uh, in order to manage your feelings, your emotions, and to regulate your health. So all health begins with mental health. So I strong, I'm an advocate of that. And also really changing your diet. You know, I would never tell a person what to eat and what not to eat. However, it's important that you put live foods into your body in order to sustain this living organism. And if you do that, along with some of the other essentials that I just mentioned, you should find yourself in a pretty good space and place. It's very interesting that you say that, you know, one of my good personal friends, uh, Dr. Terry Mason, who was formerly um, the director or the, the chief operating officer at Cook County uh, Public Health over in Chicago, um, he's he you know, started out as a urologist and he gave up his private practice um, because of the very reason that he discovered that by changing diet, um, it wasn't always necessary to just cut people. And he was sick of, of seeing you know, men in their 30s and 40s, particularly African-American men, where you know, he was recommending you know, go right into surgery and chemo and these other things where slight changes in diet and some other things and taking care of yourself you know, earlier on, you won't have to deal with these kind of things. And he really, you know, he's written a couple books about it and believes in it, um, but, but it's true that we we, we really run to the, you know, the, 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 the prescription bottle and we really run uh, to the surgeon as soon as we hear anything's wrong, but that's not always necessarily the only path. Absolutely. You know, when you think about a pyramid, there's a foundation that a pyramid sits on and then it has a, a pointed uh, uh, direction up top. And I equate that to the, the, at the top of the pyramid being your emotional, your social, and your psychological. And then on the other side of the pyramid, that would be your spiritual component. And then on the opposite side would be your physical or your health component. And so you can't just have the spiritual and negate your physical, your emotional, social, and psychological. You can't just have your health component. You go to gym every day, but you negate your spiritual component. You negate the emotional, social, and psychological. So my thing is, if you have all of them working in concert or in conjunction with one another, you really have the best of all worlds. So again, you don't want to go to the gym and be physically fit, but you emotionally damaged or you spiritually bankrupt. Or you go to church every day or you go to the mosque every day and you spiritually, spiritually enrich, but you negate your physical health or you negate your emotional, social and psychological health. So again, when all three of these are working in tandem with one another, you really have the best of all worlds. You want to constantly exercise and keep up on your health. That's one. 
Number two, you want to develop that spiritual component to the God of your understanding, if that works for you. And then again, most importantly, you can never negate your emotional, social, and psychological. You want to always stay in a good place. You think about it, a guy who goes to the gym every day and he works out, but he, he's stressed to the max. Okay, because he negated his emotional, his social, and his psychological. So again, it's important to have a healthy balance, keyword, a healthy balance, and to nurture each one of these systems. And, and now you have the best of all worlds. You, you, you mentioned emotional trauma, and uh, it's, you know, I always run out of time when I have you on the program. We start talking about the, particularly the young people out here. We're still dealing with this violence issue and, and gun violence on the streets. And um, there, there is this discussion about emotional trauma um, that particularly young men uh, go through in their upbringing, being in homes without fathers being there, um, taking on aspects of, I guess, what you would consider uh, a, a more, more female styles of emotional reaction uh, to circumstances and to stress, um, which without uh, a man's influence, uh, there is an imbalance. And I, I think I, I, it just it's my personal opinion that a lot of the, the behaviors that we see are like, what's wrong with this kid? What's wrong with that boy? Um, I think he just didn't have a man around to show him a different way to react to emotional stress. Well, I'm, I'm going to go in a different direction, George. Okay. And I want okay. you to think about what I'm saying. And I, I want the community to think about it. Uh, everything that you said is 100% true. And I think those are layers or symptoms of a bigger problem. So what do I mean when I say that? When I say those are layers or symptoms of a bigger problem, what I'm trying to say is America was founded uh, on violence. Uh, we live in a very violent culture. America is a very violent society. One of the things that most people don't talk about is we have the most psychopaths here. We have the most serial killers here. We have more murders committed in the United States than anywhere else in the world. We have more people who are mentally ill. We have more people who are drug impacted and affected in America. There is no time in America that you can turn on your television and not see violent shows, violent themes, violent programs. So we're inundated with nothing but violence. And it's, it has become palatable to us in such a way that now we thrive on it or we, 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 we look for it. We have an appetite for it. You know, we always want to see a TV show that is more gruesome or, or murderous than the one that we saw before. And so, you know, you look at our children, they watch violent video games 24 hours a day. I have clients that play video games so much. And if you ever watch, I don't want to say any names of the show because I don't, I don't want to get in trouble mentioning uh, any uh, particular brand name, but I have clients that watch these very violent, violent video games. So you think about it, if our young people have a steady diet of this on a daily basis, or whenever they get a break in the action from school, they run to a video game, or they're watching a television show, or they listen to a certain music with violent themes, that is going to have a residual effect on anybody who listens to it. I don't care if you if you if you if you if you put if you take a person off out of another environment and you bring them to the American environment and let's just say they have they come from a home with two parents. I have a lot of clients that come from two parent homes, but the kid wants to be a thug or he wants to be a gangster. Or he wants to be street like you say, well, how can that be? You come from a home. You have two parents in home. You come from a middle class home or a upper middle class home. Why is it that you want to be? a rugged, rough individual. Well, that kind of behavior has become socially acceptable in the United States. Peer pressure is, is peer pressure and peer acceptance. I know so many young people, not just young people, adults too, because we're influenced by peer pressure as well, that will do anything in order to be accepted at the expense of their own demise. And so I just think, George, is it's bigger than not having a father in the home. It's bigger than not having the financial resources, those are important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not minimizing those. What I'm saying is we live in a very violent culture, and this is the art of the day. There's no time in America that there's not crime being committed all throughout America. So go figure. You know, people are carrying guns now. Uh, young people are carrying guns. I know young people who are carrying assault weapons, and it's legal in many states, not all states, but many states. 
And we know a lot of these young people are highly temperamental. They're very, uh, they're easily influenced. They're easily agitated. They have emotional, social, and psychological issues. Many of them immature, as well as adults. And so, right. you know, when you take all that in consideration, you take road rage, you take the uh, uh, people who are on drugs and using drugs, it makes for a very violent society. So go figure. We just, uh, school just got shot up. A kid was bullied in the state of Texas maybe three or four days ago. A kid went to school and he shot up, um, I think, uh, two, adult, uh, two adults, two uh, school officials, and two students. And uh, they've had somewhere in the neighborhood of between four and 500 mass shootings this year. So go figure. You know? you're, I, I, you, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right on that. Um, these are the kinds of things we want to address. For people who want more information about the work that you do, uh, perhaps to schedule a session with you or perhaps just pick up some literature, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Okay, uh, several ways. Um, I'm, uh, I want to give out my website. The website is www.ajuma, and that's A J U M. A, Muhammad, M, U, H, A, M, M, A, D, dot org, O, R, G. Also, the website. I'm, I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing time on you here, but we just, we just want to make sure people go to the website there to find all this. I don't want to get you cut off here. I uh, did want to thank you so much for taking time. One more time, ajumamohammed.org is uh, the website to go to, and all the stuff is there, of course. You can always keep watching this program because he will be on again very soon. Um, until next time, Ajuma, good to talk to you, man. George, it's always a pleasure and honor. We're going to keep grinding and making a difference in our communities. Thank you, my brother. That's God bless. Absolutely. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week right here on Now.St. Louis.